Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever felt anxious, moody, stressed out, your relationships are falling apart, or you feel all alone, then do we have the show for you. Today we'll be talking with Dr. Amy Banks, psychiatrist and relationship expert about her latest book, Wired to Connect, the surprising link between brain science and strong, healthy relationships. Today we'll talk about how to strengthen our brain for better relationships, more success in life, and greater happiness in all that we do. Plus, we'll talk about the smart Vegas, Uncle Mitty the Frog, rabbits playing dead, Italian monkeys, super mirroring, and what Mr. Yuck has to do with anything. <laughs> so welcome to the show, Amy. Are you ready to shine? I, I am ready to shine. I'm, I'm smiling already. Thank Woo-hoo! you for that. <laughs> Sounds yes. like fun. <laughs> And, and as I was talking before the interview, your smile helped trigger a rest and relax response in me, which made me feel life is all good. So with that said, before we dive right into things, I've got to ask, what do Italian monkeys have to do with anything? Boy, Italian monkeys have uh, everything to do with the science of relationship actually and because they were the impetus they started the whole uh, process of dis- of discovering mirror neurons so imagine that there is a, a lab mm-hmm. in Parma Italy uh, of Reese's monkeys who are they might be m- macaque monkeys and they are measuring at the time and this was 20 years ago they're literally measuring a little area in the in these monkeys brains that um, fires or activates when the monkey reaches for something. It was an area called F5. Mm-hmm. Um, and they weren't looking for mirror neurons, these people who were, uh, they were really looking at motor activity in a monkey. Um, so they, but they were they, looking at just, just brain firing. Does the brain fire brain when it reaches fire. out the arm? Exactly. They weren't, they really weren't looking into how do human beings read each other or primates for that matter. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, one day uh, in the lab, what happened was that monkey who, whose neuron was attached to a little, you know, light activator or sound activator was watching another monkey reach for something. So if you can imagine that monkey that they were measuring his or her reach was watching another monkey reach and that same area of the brain lit up. And that was like an epiphany, right? That's not supposed to happen, right? At the time when we were thinking about brain functioning, motor activity or things that moved muscles uh, were separate from, uh, you know, sensory information, seeing anything. And here you had this thing happening at the same time. And it was the beginning of the discovery, again, of mirror neurons, which, te- which tell us that we read other people's attentions uh, actions, and literally even their feelings by making an internal template of what the other person is feeling. This is fascinating. I studied, uh, studied if that's the right term, I guess I studied at the Olympic Training Center many, many years ago. I mean, I was cool. a, 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 an athlete, and, and we, yeah. learned, we learned about um, basic visualization techniques. Yes. And yes. it really was, if you could see it in your mind, the body didn't know a difference, and it reacted accordingly. And, yep. and it would go both directions as well. This takes it to a whole new level, which is you see yeah. the other person doing right. it and your mind is still mirroring it. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. The mind is still mirroring it. You're having an internal sensation experience of the other per- person's activities and feelings. So then the answer to this is, uh, Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> we are no longer in Kansas. Yeah. That, it blows the whole concept that I am a rock and I have to learn how to stand on my own. That whole template, I guess it's the relational cultural theory, gets, gets tossed completely out the window. Yeah. Well, that's exactly right. Relational cultural theory, which is a model that has been around for 40 years and has been really promoting this idea that relationships are really central to human growth and well-being. Um, and what this new science is, is doing is concretizing that, right? And so that's exactly right. This idea that we are these separate entities, these discrete particles, even uh, if you think about it that way, you know, that stand on our own and function well, you know, in separation and individuation, that that's sort of the marker of uh, healthy human growth and development is, is no longer valid because we're having these internal experiences that are, that are going on all the time without our conscious awareness, right? So we're being impacted in every social situation we, be, we come in. 
So the, the separate self, I guess I meant to say yes. separate self. Separate self is gone. Yes. And, separate and self is gone. We couldn't be a separate self now, even if we tried to be. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. So, yeah. so that, that brings us to Uncle Mitty, I guess. So, <laughs> what happened you with remembered. poor Uncle Mitty? <laughs> <laughs> what a good reader you are. Um, <laughs> I said I had fun. <laughs> I know, yeah, this is great. Nobody, nobody, I've done a, a, tons of radio interviews. Nobody's asked me about Uncle, um, and it's actually un- Uncle Milty. Oh, so what me. Uncle Milty, <laughs> right, Uncle Milty was this tadpole. When my kids, I have uh, now 17-year-old twins, but when they were about six or seven years old, we ordered a frog, a tadpole, right? Mm-hmm. And the, the goal, it was from Uncle Milty, and so we called it Uncle Milty, and we brought the tadpole home, and we put it in its little habitat in the kitchen, right? And every day we would watch, come in and watch to see what, you know, body parts Uncle Milty was growing, and to, you know, basically the, the task was to watch him become a frog, right? Which was going to be great fun. And what I found myself, because I've been steeped in relational cultural theory and really uh, the neurobiology of relationship, I've been, you know, I've just been stewing in that for a couple of decades. And I, I would find myself coming in and realizing, geez, uh, Uncle Milty doesn't seem to be growing well. And I had this nagging feeling that he wasn't growing well because he was isolated, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that he didn't have his little frogs and other tadpoles around him. And uh, in fact, Uncle Milty never even, he grew a couple of stubby legs, but he never became a frog, right? Um, and as I was writing this book, I was sort of thinking about that as, as an example, because I had, uh, you know, put, put people properties on the frog, or human properties, or even primate uh, properties on the frog, but because in fact, uh, reptiles don't have all of this neurophysiology that allows them to grow and uh, develop and, and need other little froggies, other little tadpoles, right, in order to, to, to kind of grow up and develop. They're reptiles, and they have that nice reptilian brain. They can fight or flee. They can freeze. And, you know, basically what their survival depends on the parent making, you know, buckets of little ones and hoping that a few uh, survive. But it was sort of that, that kind of awareness for me that, you know, once – once we became mammals, we really became a different species, a very, very interdependent species. So uh, what then is, well, I, I guess I've got to mention, we've got two Uncle Milties here. And, 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 yeah. and there are, there are our in-laws and, or my wife, Jessica, it's her parents. And, and um, I always take, if they're put in separate places, mm-hmm. I always take and put them next to each other. Yeah. Because yeah. I am putting that, that humanness to them of, I want yes. them to be able to see each other and, yes, and have exactly. that interaction. <laughs> right, right. And now, don't don't get me wrong. I think they do have interactions, right? Mm-hmm. But the truth is... Oh, they hang out near each other from the, yeah, between them in the separate little... Other, right? And they probably are having smells. And it, it may even be at a pleasurable event. I don't know. But, but they don't need each other in the ways that human beings literally need uh, each other to survive. You know, you put Uncle Milty, by and large, apparently anything but my house, but you put Uncle Milty with a little water and some food, and he's going to become a frog, right? Mm -hmm. You put a human being in solitary confinement, and they become psychotic and get ill, right? So totally not the same. Well, it's interesting that you say that, because we are a society, and, and, and this show's really worldwide, 168 countries now, so I can't say society. We are a planet yes. where, where in most cultures, we pride ourselves on being able to stand on our own two feet and do it ourselves, and I'm not weak. I can take care of it. Yep. And what you're saying is that puts us in the proverbial frog's hot water. <laughs> you got it. Exactly. Exactly. And the water's always heating, right? And so what what is going to happen, and I actually think, I sort of say this in the book, I think what has happened in our culture, particularly this Western United States culture, is we're in the hottest pot possible, right? I think there's nowhere else on earth that we value separation and independence. And, you know, our whole country was built on, you know, separating and individuating from England, for God's sakes. I mean, this is who we are. And we take it, we take it to an extreme, And, you know, I argue that there is a real correlation between the stress of that level of separation, the expectation that we're going to be standing on our own, Mm -hmm. and actually the level of stress that we carry in our bodies, 
you know, in our brains, certainly in our bodies, and then the rates of illness, which for a, you know, quote, civilized country or a first world country, we are way behind in our level of illness. There was a Bloomberg study um, in 2012 that had us ranked in overall health, and it was a very sophisticated measure, Mm -hmm. behind, like 31st in the world behind countries like Cuba, Czechoslovakia, um, you know, countries that you really would think, hmm, (laughs) you know, here we are, the United States, we have the best healthcare system, allegedly, right? Um, But we're not healthier. And I guess a a, a logical conclusion, I'm thinking back of the, I uh, can't give the reference for it, but the cigarette study where it turns out that particularly older men, you, you'd be healthier as an older male if you have social interactions and become a chain smoker, yes. <laughs> almost, <Yeah. laughs> than yes. you would being on your own, even with your good healthy habits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, that, is, that, um, that study has been replicated over and over and over again, versions of that. Actually, there's a, a book uh, by Dean Ornish called Love and Survival, wrote uh, probably about 10 years now. And he was, you remember Dean Ornish was the cardiac guy? He yeah. was, you know, the Ornish diet. And he actually wrote a book called Love and Survival, and it documented all of the studies on the healing power of connection and the health protectiveness of connection. And, you know, he said there's some very other, I mean, I'm going to just obliterate this quote, but his quote was something to the effect that if there was a pill, <laughs> you know, that did what healthy human relationship does, uh, you know, in terms of protecting us against health, uh, against protecting our health, our well-being against illness. I mean, it would so far out be, it would outsell anything and be more effective than anything we have at this point. Vitamin L, love. Vitamin L, you got it. Yeah. Well, some people are saying it's oxytocin, right? If we could just... Well, the love drug, yes. <laughs> yeah, if we could just give people oxytocin, right? <laughs> so uh, who was Mr. Yuck? And and then what's the poison of disconnection? <laughs> you are stretching my memory. Tell me a little more about Mr. Yuck. <laughs> he may have been a sticker, ugly green character. Oh, yes, going, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're very good. Um, yeah. So one what, what of the things that I was talking about in my book is sort of trying to make a... Um, kind of the analogy, and I remembered growing up in Maine where, you know, when I was little, if you had uh, poisons around the house, you know, the the antifreeze or the hydrogen peroxide or the Clorox bleach, uh, for a while they, they stole these little, they, they built these little uh, or made these little Mr. Yuck stickers, mm-hmm. and your parent would put it on so you'd know that's not the one to, to drink, right? And so one of the things that I would say is, you know, how can we do that? for this whole theory of separation and individuation, right? This idea that separation and individuation actually will kill you, Mm -hmm. right? Um, You know, like, I really think it needs to be on the level of, you know, in the pediatrician's office, in nursery schools, in daycare centers. I mean, right at the get-go to try to reverse this toxic, poisonous theory that we're all, you know, stewing in and... uh, you know, it's impacting us in every te- breath we take in this country. Would I, would I be crazy to say, I'm thinking back to maybe in indigenous civilizations, indigenous tribes, indigenous people, who um, there's even less of a separation between the mother and the infant. There's no way yes. the child goes and gets put in a crib or gets put you in a it. playpen. There's yep. that for years, that connection going on. You got it. And that's, I, I mean, in primate um, research, you, you see this uh, all the time, right? And, you know, we have to remind ourselves that we're primates. But the idea that we are born as these little immature beings, right? Literally, our nervous system is immature. Uh, and that it takes physical connection, physical, emotional you know, a connection to the adult, whether it's the mother, the father, the parent, whatever, it takes that connection to have a chronic stimulation of these pathways for connection so that you grow into this robust, you know, resilient adult. And we, just as you're saying, I mean, this idea that we could put an infant over there, right, <laughs> in another room, in a bath, bassinet, in a, you know, wherever you want to put it, uh, or, you know, just throw the baby into a, a high chair or whatever, is very uh, unhuman, if you will, right, or inhuman. 
it's fascinating because I'm, I'm thinking of overall health and, and mm-hmm. um, I've done a lot of coaching work with athletes and, and with others. And one of the things I'm thinking about is how we can make our lives more nutrient dense. And nutrient dense is, is the food we take in, but it's also the richness of the experiences we have. Yeah. And so when the baby's over there at the, at the, the potentially the peak of brain growth, it's, yes. it's on an off yes. the chart growth it. curve yep. and there's no stimulus coming in. That's right. That's one heck of a missed opportunity for those neurons. You got it. And that's exactly it. It's one heck of a missed opportunity for those neurons. And we pay a price, right? Our kids pay a price. And in fact, you know, so this this whole idea of ferberizing our kids and, you know, there are whole techniques around child rearing that that are all about, you know, developing the separate little hyper competitive individual. Right. That, that, that's really the philosophy that's there. And in fact, you know, there there is a theory, uh, attachment parenting that um, that has uh, gained, you know, a pretty wide following. And it's you wear the baby, the you know, the little slings and sleeping with a baby and all that. But it's interesting. I don't know if you remember, but about I don't know, it was a number of years ago, one of the major magazines had this provocative cover of like, a, you know, a, a grown woman breastfeeding a you know, like a 15 year old or something. I don't know exactly oh, what it was. No, no, no. I haven't seen this one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, but it was, you know, it was purposely provocative, mm-hmm. you know, and took kind of attachment parenting to the extreme, you know, and it, and it sort of, I sort of had that feeling like, right, of course you're going to do this, right? We, we count in a capitalist society, the way that it's set up, we count on this competition, right? We count on pitting people against each other, to climb to the top of the heap, right? What uh, happens if we start attaching all over the place? I, I, I've got to interrupt you. How's yes. your basketball game? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, was shoot, I was shooting hoops this weekend. Yeah. Very good, very good. Very you, good. You, 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 so, you have in your book about competition that, that, yes. that it's not about competition except if somebody gets you on the, on the, the uh, parquet. So, yeah, that's right. That's right. I mean, this is, listen, I come from the most hyper competitive family going. So I, I, you know, and in fact, I have a friend and when I was uh, describing this, you know, the chapter I was writing on competition, she just laughed in my face. She's like, really, (laughs) you're going to pull that off. But what I'm saying is, is it's not the competition. I think there's, and I think guys get this in some ways and, and actually athletes get this, that you can be competitive and friendly. Yes. Right. Uh, you know, it's, it's that you can have a good game of basketball or, or run a good race or, you know, whatever you can, you can compete and want to be the best you can be. The kind of competition we have in our, I think in our culture that I think is so toxic is the, the, um, going head to head with somebody else, either for resources that are really limited, Mm -hmm. you know, and we see this in the, you know, in the, uh, distribution of wealth that, you know, the fact is that when you have the dramatic distribution of wealth that we have in our country, that is correlated with poor health for both sides, you know, the up, the high and the low. And so comp- it's the competition that says you have no value, mm-hmm. right? You're less than, you're socially excluded, basically. And I would think with competition too, and this kind of jumps ahead and maybe, maybe we should dive into some of these areas here. Yeah. Um, but it really, competition, even if you win, is firing a sympathetic nervous system response, a fight or flight response, and a defensive protect the, mm-hmm. the armies at the, at the moat, yeah. <laughs> yes. put yes. up the defenses. Yeah. Plus, you're not getting any of the happy chemicals going on that happen when you nurture and take care of each other. So you're getting a double whammy by trying to fight yeah. against the Joneses. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and again, it's it, on the basketball court when everybody's friendly and they shake hands afterwards, it, it's one thing. But when when you become uh less than because you don't have the right sneakers or because you're of the color of your skin, you know, the pain of that has long standing implications uh for health and well being. And I think sets up a, you know, a feedback loop, right, where you might be on the top today, Mm -hmm. but tomorrow, you know, you live in fear that you're going down, (laughs) right? So going from there, let's let's jump ahead a little bit. One of the things that that blew me away early on in the book 
is I think of our traditional Western model of psychiatry and psychology and come in and um, it's this very, for lack of another term, disassociated, sterile individual who's mm-hmm. going to ask you about your childhood. And they don't, it doesn't feel, they're very caring people or they wouldn't be in the profession, but there's a wall up, this yep. massive wall. And then in your book, you said, we've been doing things a little bit differently and the results have worked slightly differently. <laughs> yeah, right, right, <laughs> right, right. And you know, with that, what I'm talking about is relational cultural theory. I trained in a psychiatric system. I'm a psychiatrist by training and in a system that was very, uh, you know, very old school, but there was a lot of old school, just as you describe, which is your job is to do therapy on that person, right? And part of that Believe therapy me. process <laughs> is, you know, is that this person came in and one of, one of my, I like to tell this story when I, when um, I was training, I I worked in, my office was on the second floor, Mm -hmm. and I came down, I trained in a very uh, chronically, with a very chronically ill population, a lot of people with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, and I would have to walk down two flights of stairs, down a whole hallway, and I was literally told by supervisors, you call for your client, and then you walk up the entire way, right, in the elevator, in up the stairway, You don't say anything because if you say anything, that's out of the frame of the therapy and that's a violation of the client, right? And it was crazy making. I I don't think I ever made it to the top without saying something, right? You you have a heart. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. It was just so ridiculous. But that really, in a very concrete way, and I think that there are a lot of therapies that still operate you know, with vestiges, if you will, of that model. And relational cultural therapy basically says, okay, you're he- you are healing within a relationship. And the point of the relationship is that, A, it's got to be a real relationship. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm telling you all my problems, right? But if I'm not a real person that you can feel, that you can be empathic with, that you can resonate with, then there's no way these pathways for connection are going to grow and develop. Right. And so the, the very the, your biggest uh, asset as a therapist is you mm-hmm. and the, your capacity to build relationship, a real relationship. And that has to happen in that time you spend with somebody. Beautiful and a mighty woohoo, because it, that that is so it's so radical. It sounds yeah. like something, <laughs> isn't it? Which is ridiculous, <laughs> which is ridiculous. Right. So right. so what are you, you mentioned resonance? What are the four neural pathways for healthy relationships? Yeah. So let, let me st- start by saying, you know, I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm a bit of a neuro geek, but I also so that I always have to, uh, you know, st- start talking about these by saying that. I'm sort of not allowed to do this reductionistic thing with neuroscience. Nobody, you know, people that are real neuroscientists don't like you to do that. So, so what I want to say is um, what I did is I took a whole bunch of information and I mm-hmm. kind of narrowed it down to something that would be workable for people. Um, and so what I talk about is four pathways for connection, four mm-hmm. primary neural pathways for connection. I use the uh, mnemonic uh, CARE, C-A-R-E, um, which, of course, refers to what are the qualities of a healthy relationship. And so C stands for a sense of calm that you get uh, when you're in a really healthy relationship. Um, you want me to go through the science of each one quickly? Uh, sure. Why not? We'll geek out on it a little bit. And then, okay. and then I want to make sure we cover a little bit on how we can help people today. Yeah, that's great. So, so C is for, for calm. So it's this idea that... Um, we have a third pathway of our autonomic nervous system. So when I, again, when I was in medical school, and I think a lot of people are still taught that the, the autonomic or automatic nervous system is composed of the fight or flight system or the freeze. So the sympathetic is fight or flight, parasympathetic is freeze. And that that's how we deal with uh, people, how we deal with, you know, the environment. And Steve Porges at University of Chicago, Illinois, came up with a third pathway, and it's called the smart vagus nerve. So imagine that uh, evolutionarily, when mammals came about 50,000 years ago or so, a pathway developed um, 
from cranial nerve 10, which is the, the parasympathetic or the vagus nerve, that goes into the muscles of facial expression, the muscles in your, uh, you know, like your eyebrows, and those little teeny muscles in your inner ear, your throat, your, uh, for swallowing, but also your larynx for speaking. And what happens is when you deem somebody to be, I mean, just as you were saying, you, you come on, we haven't seen each other before, but I see, ah, look at, he's got a nice smile. He's friendly. I can just see your, your, your smart Vegas is kind of activated, mm-hmm. right? You say something kind to me uh, and I smile and then you're like, oh, it's a good smile. So all of a sudden, both of, and what happens when the smart Vegas is stimulated yep. is it literally feeds into your sympathetic nervous system and says, stand down, you're not necessary. And in that call way, call off the guards. <laughs> call off the guards. We don't need you. And in that way, we actually feel calmer mm-hmm. when we are connected in a healthy relationship. So that's C, okay? Uh, a is stands for a sense of acceptedness you have. And mm-hmm. uh, when you are, in a relationship, a community, whatever, where you feel you belong. And this references work done uh, at UCLA, Eisenberger and Lieberman. It's something that they call spot theory, social pain overlap theory. And the long and short of this is that they did a cyber experiment of uh, looking to see what happens when people are being socially excluded. This okay, is, and the what, cyber balls. The cyber ball, right? Oh, so somebody comes in, there's a subject, <laughs> computer, I know, so evil. Um, and they're tossing... Uh, you know, a cyber ball around to these little you know, puffy characters on the screen, slowly they're left out. So, you know, a couple of things we can say about that is one, it's a pretty mild form of social exclusion, right? right. They're little, rejected by somebody you don't even know. Or... It's not even a person, right? It's a person, <laughs> right? It could be, it's like a, you know, like a we, if you will. But what's interesting is that uh, most people feel bad. So as they're being excluded, they feel bad. And so then they looked at what area of the brain was lit up or activated. And they found this area, the dorsal anterior cingulate gyrus. And what they found was, or when they kind of compared what goes on in that area, it's the exact same area that lights up with the distress of physical pain. Okay. So if we imagine for human beings and for, uh, you know, primates and that being close to your group, your tribe, your parent is so important that it uses the same alarm system as if you are in physical danger. It makes right? me think, it, it, it just, just triggered the thought, it's making me think of, of, of baby and mama. You got it. Yep. That's exactly right. So, you know, baby's over there. In the, <laughs> when mom's over there, baby dies, <laughs> yeah. right? So, Baby gets an infection, the same alarm system's going on. So mm-hmm. that's exactly right. You can't, you cannot thrive. You can't. And, and that stays with us all through our lives, right? We have that. And in fact, what people have found is, you know, of course, that the, the more you have experience of being left out, the louder that alarm com- becomes. Or if you have really chronic pain experiences, that alarm also is, can be louder, so it's, it's, and it's also a heightened response that you, you got, sort of, sort of like I don't know if we'll have time to go into her, but there's uh, there's a great example of of Brooke, new employee, gets invited yes. to a party, and yes. because her alarm system has already gone gone off, everybody appears as a foe to her yes. because of her heightened sensitivity. Exactly. So she walks into a group. She's already being. She's already reading the room as if she's being socially excluded. Mm-hmm. Right. It's become that sort of uh, predictable for her that it just plays out. The alarm system goes off. The, the analogy I use is sort of you get a bug in your, in your fire alarm, right? And it can be going off, but it's not necessarily accurate, mm-hmm. right? And that happens a lot. If people have been teased or bullied, I think it happens around, you know, microaggressions and flat out racism, homophobia, all of those things can really activate the alarm system. So that's A. R we've touched on a little bit with the resonance, the mirror neuron system. And that's basically that that idea that in order to be resonant with somebody, which is a characteristic of a healthy relationship, your ability to read and be read by somebody else, read the intentions, actions, and feelings of somebody else is dependent on this mirror neuron system that was first discovered in Parma in these monkeys. Um, and that, you know, the, ideally what we, what we want is a mirror neuron system that is accurate enough so that, uh, and labeled enough. It's very, um, so that like I see a motion on you or I see an action in you 
And based on my experience of what I know, right, both I feel it, I make a template of it, and then I come to an understanding of it. So pairing those things up is really crucial. So if you have someone, for example, I, I tend to, I, I work in the field of trauma and abuse, and if you have somebody who is told um, this, let's say, this relative who is abusing you loves you, oh, right? No. That feeling, okay, oh, this is love, right? And we see that a lot. Then people that come out of abusive situations, they have the feeling and that's love, right? I mean, they get it that it's also uncomfortable or whatnot. But so pairing those up and being able to read accurately is a huge, huge function of a healthy relationship. So, and then finally, the E is uh, the energy that you get in a healthy relationship. And that kind of uh, references um, the idea that our dopamine reward system, right? That little, uh, I like to call, yeah, I like to call the carrot on the stick that in the beginning when we're first, you know, developing mm -hmm. things that are healthy for us, right? So actually nurturance, hugging, being held by your mom, um, food, healthy food, water, you know, things that are basically uh, healthy give us a little stimulation of dopamine. So we get a little bump of euphoria, you feel good, energy, motivation. And ideally what we want to do is keep that paired to healthy relationships. So, yeah. you know, when you go out and you hang out with your best friend or your boyfriend, your girlfriend, whatever, or, or maybe your family is one of those that actually is healthy and you go and you spend time with them, you actually feel good. Gene Baker Miller, who was one of my mentors, calls it that a sense of zest or energy that you get when you're in a healthy relationship. And I think one of the major things that happens in our culture is that in this, um, in our desire to make little automatrons, these little individual packets of people, right? The more we do that, the more we separate dopamine from healthy relationship. And then people go to other uh go to other sources of dopamine and they're abundant. So I think, you know, power will give you dopamine, uh, you know, drugs and alcohol, a new, you know, a, a, an afternoon in the mall. I mean, there's a, this whole consumer society, I think, also jumps in and stimulates dopamine. And so there lots, are substitutes. Lots and lots, of, as you put it, addictions. Uh, addictions of every kind. Yep. Yep, exactly. So, so that's care, and maybe we should go through each one individually and briefly look at maybe one way that we can help. So, so C for calming or making yep. our smart uh, Vegas smarter. Yes, making our smart Vegas sm smarter. So if you think about it, ideally the smart Vegas, basically what all of us are up against is we're in a culture that encourages us to be separate, mm -hmm. Which, me, which by definition, right, by definition, stimulates our sympathetic nervous system. It's a stress response. Guards right? are up. So the more yeah. separate we are, the more the guards are up, the more that we're going to be separate. That's right. Exactly. It's a, it's a self-fulfilling loop. So one of the things that I have, and, and then, you know, of these three pathways, smart Vegas, sympathetic nervous system, parasympathetic, you want them to be balanced, right? You want an accurate reading. You want to, when you're really in danger, you want to be able to fight or flight or flee, or flee, exactly. flee right? Um, and so for most of us, what that means is both decreasing our sympathetic nervous system, mm -hmm. and we can do that through, you know, time-tested things, whether it's relaxation response, uh, meditation, exercise, you know, there's a whole bunch of ways, medications for that matter. But then there's this idea of how would you stimulate your smart Vegas? And, you know, one of the things that I like to share with people is that it's not that easy. <laughs> you and I are doing it right now, right? Well, I, when little, you first said that, you were looking down and I went, you said, how do we stimulate? And I put this big <laughs> <laughs> beaming <Yeah>. grin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. So I tell people, you know what, spend the day, keep, keep an eye on when you're walking around during the day, that you actually, when you pass somebody, greet them. Mm -hmm. When you're at the checkout counter, yeah, smile yeah. and say hi. It's a win-win. You, you know, nine times out of ten, they say hi back, mm -hmm. they get a smile, they're stimulating, and that is a workout for your smart vagus nervous system. Beautiful, yeah. and very, very simple. And simple, right? Yeah. There was another one that I saw, and I don't know if it's specifically Facebook related or not, but it's simply, you know, hopping on your phone if you need a pick me up and yep. looking at smiles of friends. Yeah. I yeah. One of the things that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a promoter of is if we are going to have technology, which we are, mm -hmm. right? 
let's use it. Let's do pro-social technology. And so and what occurred to me is one day I was watching uh, my daughter. She was about 15 at the time. And, you know, she's a kid that, uh, you know, for better or worse, has had to listen to this stuff at home <laughs> about relationship and has good friends and, you know, and, you know, loves her friends deeply. And what I would see is when she would get, uh, you know, an Instagram or a selfie or whatever, you could just see she would look at it and be in her body, right? Oh, yay. You know, it's sort of like, ah, you know. And so it was like she had a little snippet mm -hmm. of that good connection that existed with that friendship. Now, there are some kids that don't have those connections, right, that really don't for whatever reasons. Maybe, you know, maybe they're pushed too hard or maybe they're, they've been traumatized or whatever. And then I think, you know, technology can be difficult and confusing and, you know, it's hard to read the messages. But, yeah, I mean, you can – Build yourself a little library of your favorite pictures of your favorite friends, and then you get literally a little, you get a little uh, uh, smart Vegas workout as well as a dopamine workout simply by looking through those. You know, yeah. Th this makes me think. Also, get a pet. <laughs> get a pet. Get a pet. Nothing like a pet. Absolutely. So there's if you one like. Yes, if you like pet routes, it'll give you a different response. We don't exactly. want that. Right, right. Before right. we move on to A accepted, there's there's one more here on under care or, or under calm that I haven't seen in books elsewhere, and it's something that Jessica and I practice, and and I like the reminder because we'll be practicing it more now, which is relational mi relational mindfulness, or what we simply call gazing. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Gazing, right? <laughs> it's so simple. Gazing, not grazing, but gazing. Right? Um, <laughs> sounds it, simple. <laughs> it sounds simple. It isn't simple. I do this in my yes. workshops uh, a lot. And uh, what is simple about it is you basically sit across from somebody and we could do it here, right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, when we're like on, you can do it on Skype or anything like that or FaceTime or whatever. But looking across from uh, somebody else and doing a, medita a meditative practice. So you, you know, your mantra internally could be something like, um, you know, compassion for myself, compassion for my other, for my friend or this person I'm engaged with, compassion for the relationship and just a steady breathing in, steady breathing out. This is you would in a calming meditation practice. Um, and literally the eye, the facial contact stimulates, it's a very intense experience and st stimulates, will stimulate the smart vagus. For a lot of people, what's very interesting, right, is that they start to do it. And whenever I do this in a large group, I have one group, mm -hmm. two or three people, and they can't stop laughing. There's a, a little bit of a kind of shame, embarrassment, mm -hmm. and just giddiness. And I often will have people that start to do it and just tear oh. up. You know, um, the idea of being seen, of being held in this kind of intentionally compassionate way can be really profound for people. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and I think it's, it's something not to go into lightly, but in our experience yeah. has been hugely beneficial for the relationship. And there have been times where we've laughed. There have been more than a few times we've cried yeah. <laughs> and yes. everywhere in between. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally agree. Totally agree. So let's, yeah. let's go to uh, A for accepted. And what can we do to soothe the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex? Say that yeah. 10 times fast. <laughs> Can't say, yeah, yeah, exactly. Don't, don't. Because that won't do it. That won't do it. So, you know, one of the things that I really focus on in the exercises for this area is, number one, to help people understand that we live in a culture, they live in a culture that stimulates the dorsal anterior cingulate gyrus. And we do this partly by... Uh, our inability to uh, manage difference, okay? And so to first of all have people understand that what happens in a power over culture and in this kind of separate self culture is when you see difference in somebody else, and of course that's all there is, right, ultimately, we judge it automatically and then, then we stratify it, right? So it's sort of, you know... Categorizing it. Categorizing it, exactly. And then those categories categorizations or those judgments live in us. Mm -hmm. And for most people, and, I, and again, this is an exercise I will do in, in workshops, is I have people spend 30 minutes, have a little a cheat sheet, you know, have a little sheet that says judgment for myself or, you know, against or against somebody else, against myself. For It can be positive, negative, but just to sort of do an assessment. Oftentimes, in order to change brain patterns, we have to, we have to kind of know what we're up against and what, what the assessment is and to sort of just watch the judgments. 
and sort of how quickly, you know, what they, what they feel like, whether it's a, you know, I'm not as smart as this person or I'm not as pretty as this person, whatever it is, and sort of the way that we stratify it. And then at another time, literally try a practice, a non-judgmental practice. And it is a practice. It's again, it's a mindfulness practice. But, you know, you can get into this refrain. Um, there's a guy, Barry Schwartz, who ca- talks about relabel and refocus, right? So let's catch it, okay? There is a judgmental thought. And just to s- sort of say, in, not to just assume it's reality, right? Because our minds play out all of this stuff that we assume is reality because we don't check it. Right. And so if you can begin to check it and just say, oh, there's my judgmental brain, Mm -hmm. you know, let me think of another way to think about this or a more, you know, more uh, bonding way rather than, you know, all the time pushing for the separation in the, you know, the the difference and, you know, accentuating that and stratifying it. I'm hearing my, my mind going, uh, be quiet, you, I don't know, um, yeah. uh, oversensitive amygdala. <laughs> yes, exactly. But you know what I mean? But but that really is what gets going. It's like, you know, you're not a horrible person if you spend most of your time judging. You're a person that has been trained that that's one of the ways to kind of assess and get ahead and or get behind or whatever. I mean, it, we, we live in a culture that teaches us this from the very, very beginning of our socialization process. So it makes sense that we would need to practice. Exactly. Practice. So from there, let's talk about um, resonance, strengthening our brain's mirroring system. And I have a unique question that my wife wanted me to ask here. Okay. Because she, she, we started talking about your book and, and uh, about the, the Italian monkeys. And, mm-hmm. and she's going, that explains it. When you're stressed out, that's why I get stressed out. Yeah. And, and, and I'm like, yes. guilty as charged, clearly. Yes. Yes. But the question becomes, and this is particularly important for caregivers, and, and she's a healer herself, is yep. you talk about super mirroring, and I'm wondering if both of you can explain what that is, and is it possible to really shut things off so that you, it, it, that you are, to put a force field up if you need to for people that are spinning out of control around you, or are you yeah. inherently going to get some of that? Yeah. So it's a great question. Okay. It's a great question. So thank your wife for the question. Will do. Um, <laughs> and what I would say is this, and I think the science is still getting teased out mm-hmm. on this. So I, I don't have a, an absolute answer, but I think it is where, so if you imagine, for instance, uh, when we're talking about stress, then we're really talking about the reading of affect, mm-hmm. right? So you're talking about the extent to which uh, you see stress in another person and it goes literally to your body, to your visceral sense, right? And I think one of the ways that we manage that, mm-hmm. right, is to get cognition back online. And I think some of the super mirror neurons uh, will be... What's what? Uh, uh, awareness. To be, by getting back That's online, right. you're meaning say, hey, this isn't mine. I don't own this. I can see what's going on. Exactly, exactly. And I think, you know, if you think about anybody who's in a healing profession, right, if you didn't, I mean, part of the task is, right, how do you balance the cognition with the affect, Mm -hmm. right? Um, And that's a very, um, you know, it can be very tenuous. If you have somebody that's a healer that's all affect, Mm -hmm. they're going to burn out, right? But if you have a healer that's all cognitive, they're not going to be a healer. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? It's, and you see this balancing. Can, can I ba- pause you for a sec? For, can you expl- define effect and, uh, a- affect and cognitive yeah. for people yeah. listening? Sure. So uh, thinking, let's, thinking and feeling, mm-hmm. right? So um, what we know is thinking, this cortex, this outer layer, this cortex of the human brain yep. has lots of inhibitory uh, f- uh, pathways into our feeling centers, Okay, so that literally we can think ourselves off the ledge, right? (laughs) Yes. Um, And that's one of the benefits for being of being human. But it takes again, it takes a lot of practice. So if you look at an infant, they're born very right brained, which means sort of by definition, in those first three years of life, they're very affect, affective and emotional, right? Everything is about the feeling. 
right? And you can see sort of as kids b- grow and develop and as the cortex become, becomes more richly uh, connected to deeper areas of the brain, the mm-hmm. thinking brain, right? And and literally there's a maturation and a myelination process that happens that starts in childhood and goes, we now know, into the mid-20s, right? Where this frontal cortex particularly is still working to get online to help us manage our emotions, mm-hmm. right? And so I guess, what, so what I'm saying is that when, yeah, it's, it's part of um, how one, manages Mm -hmm. all of the intensity of being in a relationship, you have to balance it some with the cognition. And what I mean by that is literally to be able to send some inhibitory messages back there that says, oh, my husband is stressed. I'm not stressed. My husband is stressed. You know what I mean? And then when you're in a relationship, think about this. Like my partner, we're traveling on Friday. Mm -hmm. My partner hates to travel, okay? She began, she shut down. She started to shut down three days ago. Oh, no. One, and, and I could feel it. And, mm-hmm. you know, I'm walking around feeling irritated and like just agitated to be home. And like everything was bugging me. And I think what I was picking up on is her stress. Mm-hmm. Finally, last night, she said, I just want to remind you, I'm already starting to shut down because we're traveling. And it was like, oh, yeah, okay. So I now have that. And I, my, my agitation is shut, is less up so so forgive me for asking but but this goes at our relationship my wife and myself it goes at so many relationships uh, 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 as well she's getting agitated and starting to shut down it's actually a question i've written down here yep. and based on your response she can have a further response to that and you can start this this dance going you got on it. That's so it. how do you either cut off the dance or repair the damage even years later if the dance isn't still going on, but there's still, in in that cortex, there's still a memory of this dance which is yep. still putting her guard up. Yeah. It, it, unwinding some of these very deep, you know, very programmed at this point mm-hmm. in relational templates is difficult but not impossible, okay? So one of the things, I mean, this is where... Uh, clarity, clarity about yourself, the other person, and the relationship comes in. And one of the things that I really like, and you know, you might start doing this with with your wife, is something that I talk about in my book called spot checks. Mm-hmm. Okay, and what if you? Because I think nine times out of ten, we feel the other person, right? Unless we're, you know, kind of really shut down, we feel the other person how we then make sense of what we're feeling. So we have the resonance and how we make sense of it yeah. is through our own experience and off it's, it's a miss, right? Oh yeah, it can be a huge miss. <laughs> That's right. So, so rather than, you know, what, rather than have, playing out that experience over and over again, right? Misreading, misreading, misreading. Exactly. And, and you just, you know, throughout the day, let's say, okay, we're going out for the afternoon, we're going to the movies, we're going out to dinner, and and let's just from time to time, anybody can call a spot check at any time. And what you do is you look at the other people, person, read what they're, what you're feeling from them, yep. and then name what you think it means. Name what you think they're feeling. And then listen closely to what they're actually feeling. Does that make sense? It, it makes sense. And, and it, it both would take practice. And then you have to take really careful note and go, okay, when she or he is, feel, is, is doing this, and I always thought it meant, well, they're upset with me or something like that. That's it right. may have absolutely nothing to do with me. And I got to put that in the memory banks. Or it you may have it. everything to do with me. That's <laughs> I right. Put that and in I the have to banks. put that in the memory banks. But, but you think about it. I mean, one of the things that we do as a human species, right, mm-hmm. because we have we have the capacity, we have these memories and imagination. And we spend a lot of time in our imaginary relationships, not in the one that's actually right here in the moment, yeah. right? And it's sort of how do you get here in the moment with the person you're actually in a relationship with? That makes sense. Well, thank you. That will be helpful for our relationship. I'm sure it'll be helpful for so many <laughs> more people. We will be spot checking. So, yes. so let's go from spot checking. Let's talk about E, energetic. Yes. How yes. do we get the dopamine back dopamine response system or reward system back online and appropriately? 
Yeah. So the first thing, again, this comes in, in my, my standard thing is you got to have some awareness, right? So one of the things I have people do is just as starter, think about, make a list of all the things that you do to get dopamine, right? Good, bad, and otherwise, you know, might be the drink at the end of the day, might be the pint of ice cream, it might be the hour you spend at the gym, it might be a lunch with a friend, you know, whatever it is, what do you do to get dopamine? Then what I have people do is say, okay, is there any of that Mm -hmm. that is getting in the way of actually relationship and dopamine, right? I'll pause you for a brief sec because I'm thinking of one that most people might not be thinking of, which is their phone. Yes. Particularly if it's a smartphone, we get a dopamine hit each time it goes doing and you get a yep. Facebook comment or doing yep. you've got a text yeah. and then you go and you take your phone and you drop down from the person you're with. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Doing a cyber ball exercise right there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's exactly right. Right. So that's building an awareness. Right. Mm-hmm. So really, you know, those are the things that you want to that you want to try to uh, kind of be in touch with. And at that point, then what I have people do is, okay, is there any one or two that you're doing really repetitively Mm -hmm. in a way that takes you away from relationship, right? Um, And if so, uh, entering into some agreement, maybe with a friend, maybe with a partner, whatever, that... A, you don't want to do that, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there has to be an intentionality to it. So, you know what? I don't want to be, whenever I'm with you, running off to my cell phone. Maybe the two of you decide, okay, you know what? If When we're talk, let's turn our cell phones off. You know, you could do that. But but there are a whole host of things. You know, if it's really an addiction, you know, at what level, what kind of help do you need? I've had people that, you know, will, uh, you know, they're trying to maybe not overeat because they're doing that, you know, they're coping with that. They're using food as a way to cope. And, you know, they make a pact with somebody that actually they're going to use their cell phone to say, okay, uh, you know, this is what I had for breakfast, you know? Um, How do you flip on the dopamine reward system more for the relationship to say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm addicted I'm addicted to to whatever it is. It it could be as strong as a as a, a yeah. porn addiction or, or yeah. an alcohol yep. addiction. But I want to replace that with getting that hit out of my relationship. How do I? I guess in a sense, it's bring the fire back to the relationship to make yeah. it more powerful than those other things. Yeah. Well, so the relationship there has to be something good about the relationship, right? Now. Makes sense. Um, I mean, there's got to be something rich that's in there. And in the book, I talk about a couple that really sort of go, you know, really drift off and go their own separate ways within the relationship with frustrations or whatever. There has to be a coming back to, there has to be a turning into. Otherwise, you're not going to get the dopamine hit, right? If, if, If you turn toward the person you're trying to turn toward and what you're getting is stress and anxiety and critique and all of that, then it's, the it's not going to work. <laughs> exactly. That's right. That's not going to work. So, there, you, you know, whether you do it in couples therapy, whether you make a concerted effort with, let's say, a partner to, you know, maybe you visit, maybe you think together about the early days of your relationship. I mean, that's one of the things that I always like about, you know, what do you, what do you appreciate about, appreciate about the other person? I've had people actually, um, sort of say, okay, we're going to end the night before we go to sleep with an appreciation. You know, what do I, what do I appreciate about you? You know, very simple things, you know, it's, so it's not like, you know, all of a sudden you look at, you know, the person that you're supposed to love and you just love them again. It doesn't happen like that, right? You have to kind of tap into, um, sort of the, you know, intentionally tap into the goodness of the other person. Beautiful. We're going we're gonna to start to wrap things up with a, yes. a, a few wrap-up questions in a few minutes. Before that, the one, the one that's coming to mind is for people out there who are struggling by repeating bad relationships, yeah. what yeah. advice would you give them? Well, what advice I would give them is it's not inevitable. Just because you've had bad relationships doesn't mean you are going to repeat them always. Um, but 
not repeating them takes a fair amount of awareness. You know, one of the things that I have in the book is something I call the a relational awareness assessment. And you can, you can take this assessment, kind of look at the relational web that you have, answer these 20 questions about, which will give you information both about your pathways for connection, right? These four neural pathways for connection, but also about the ways that your, the relationships in your life are now, uh, working to shape those pathways, right? And so you get a little bit different um, lay of the land, if you will, in terms of yourself in connection with others. Um, and by doing that, you can sometimes see some obvious things, you know, well, well, you know, I notice, for instance, you know, I don't trust anybody, or I have a hard time reading people or, you know, across the boards. And so I think you have to, you have to, you know, one of the things that the book does is it actually helps people go from, I keep repeating bad relationships to what are my relationships like? What are my pathways for connection like? Mm -hmm. And then what can I do about it? Right? That makes sense. So from there, any words of wisdom that you would give parents with kids to help them start to rev things up? Yeah, you know, but my, my message to parents of kids is play, 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 right? Nice. Kids need to play. I mean, that's where their brains develop best. It's where uh, we just know that on every single level. Even when they're in school, they need to play. They need to uh, learn through play, you know, and stay connected, stay connected physically. Mm -hmm. um, and start learning for yourself the very real um, repercussions of the kind of hyper competitive society we have, um, because it's it's it has it's a health epidemic at this point, and I think when parents know that, and when they they can learn some you know different relationship skills themselves, and it's much easier to pass it on to the kids, you know. So in a sense, you're saying throttle back, be less concerned about either the, the grades or the result or the outcome right now, let's focus more on the fun because that's going to build our resilient brain yeah. so that we can go much further in life than whatever stressor we're putting you under now. Exactly, exactly. And when kids play, they learn more. When they're not stressed, when they are in that hyper-stressed place, they learn less well. So, you know, tying that in, the, when they play, when they have that freedom, they're taking more in. They will be what you're trying to create, but it will be far less miserable. Beautiful. Would you throw them out into nature? Absolutely. Absolutely, <laughs> without a doubt. Excellent. Well, a wrap-up question we like to ask all of our guests just before the end is, what personally brings you the greatest happiness or what I call the woohoo factor? My kids, without a doubt, my kids. And seeing them uh, in all of their quirky, mm -hmm. uh, sassy, humorous complexity. Beautiful. So before we let you go, we'll do a, a meditation, brief meditation at the end. The last question I have before that is any words of wisdom or parting words you want to share with people? You know, I, I want to share with people that we are in a very... Um, you know, very kind of dark time in a lot of ways. And, uh, you know, in terms of t uh, the world, disconnections, um, and that it doesn't really need to be this way. Um, and I think that the message of relationship and the actual skills of relationship really can be tr transformative to people's individual lives, but also to their communities. And, I, you know, I think it's really a grassroots trickle-up effect to kind of re- refocus our energies on something that is much more natural um, and normal and easy for people. It's making me think of a farmer's market versus a uh, supermarket. Exactly. Beautiful. <laughs> right. I, I, I love it. So I love your book. I've really geeked out on it. You can see it's, it's fairly it. dog-eared and marked up. Um, where can people go to get your book and to uh, find out more? My book is in all the big bookstores. They can go to Amazon.com, uh, Buck a Book, Barnes & Noble, all of those places. It's there. It's in Kindle. It's in paperback now, which is, which is great. So they can go there. Uh, they can go to my website, which is amybanksmd.com. 
um, as well as uh, the Jean Baker Miller Training Institute. It's jbmti.org. Fantastic. And we'll put those links on our website as well, so that if you're driving down the road and you're going, J.D., what was that? J.B.M. <laughs> yeah, yes, please do. Go That's to InspireNationShow.com. We'll get you over there. I want to thank you so much. Did you have a short meditation um, or practice that you could guide us in? Yeah, the, me- the meditation or the practice that I want to guide in is also something that I do in all of my workshops. And I start with, and it's a very simple, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to talk much through it, but what I want to say is I want people to take one minute, literally one minute, and to um, focus on a healthy relational moment. I call it a positive relational moment. And to, as, as I'm talking now, to just be thinking about that, that interaction that you had. Where did you uh, feel it in your body? What does it feel like? Sort of in body embody that interaction that you had and see what you notice. And we're just going to do that for another 30 seconds. And I want to say as people are doing this that what that does is it allows you to tap into these pathways of connection. Most people will end up feeling as though they have kind of a lightness, you know, they uh, kind of a deep breathing, more oxygen moving literally and sort of a sense of calm that we can all get when we're centered in our best relationships. And you can do it one minute a day. And that's it. <laughs> ah. <laughs> well, thank you so much. It has been a true pleasure, Amy, having you on the show. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>